Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Molly Sauer. I am here from two organizations, uh, from the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center, as well as on behalf of my team on the Choices Initiative. So I'll be speaking about some of the role of choices in supporting your efforts, and then hopefully doing a little bit more on some of the conversations you heard just a few moments ago about making implementation decisions for introduction of these two vaccines. So just a bit of brief background on the Choices Initiative, um, in case this is the first time that you are, are learning of us. Um, Choices is a three-partner consortium representing Johns Hopkins, so myself here today, and my team, as well as colleagues from JSI and from the US CDC. And we work in close partnership with WHO, Gavi, UNICEF, and the Gates Foundation to try to bridge some of the gaps between the information, guidance, and resources that you are hearing from at the global level and from key partners into implementing that in your respective settings. So our role is really to be a complementary partner and to try and support countries in reaching high levels of coverage, in prioritizing new interventions, and as Veronica just discussed, optimizing programs that are already in place. So trying to improve the suitability and sustainability of those. We have a dual purpose of providing additional support upstream. So trying to assist Gavi, WHO, UNICEF, and other partners in providing best fit resources and information to again provide support down to countries. Um, our work spans five domains, which I realize is a lot of text here, but I will summarize. Um, two of the core areas, as I mentioned, are in optimization of EPI programs. So looking at what switches can be made to the existing portfolio after in place, whether that's a change to the product as new ones become available, or responding to issues that make the current choice unavailable in the near term. We also work on prioritization, which is what we're here for today, trying to understand how to best approach new additions to the EPI portfolio, and to look at those, kind of the bigger picture of how these vaccines fit into broader communicable disease control programs and strategies. On the flip side, we have a lot of work that goes into generating and updating resources to, again, equip all of you with what you need to make these decisions and to refine those tools based on your feedback so that we have an iterative process moving forward. Um, additionally, we work with partners on capacity strengthening, as you've heard a lot about already this week, and on actually implementing those decisions, which in many cases can range from supporting the Gavi application development and budgeting process uh, to doing planning following acceptance of that application moving towards actual introduction. Um, but as I mentioned, I was asked today to talk about some of the implementation decisions that you'll be making, many of which, as Veronica just noted, have already been made, which is great, but we'll call this a refresher. So the first one to talk about is your product and presentation choice. We've heard a lot this morning about the different options available for these two vaccines uh, and the different characteristics between them that might make one more or less suitable for a given setting. So there are a number of considerations and the ranking of these criteria that you see on the screen is going to be very different by different settings. So in some cases, the priority may be on addressing storage capacity, making sure your cold chain is well suited for this product. In other cases, there might be a preference for uh, ease of administration. So it's important to evaluate these criteria um, and especially using some of the, the frameworks that Benjamin laid out earlier to determine which ones are best suited. And I'll echo some of the comments earlier that equally important is to make sure there is both a first and second choice uh, because there are variations that can have larger effects on the application and the additional planning that's in place. A last one I will highlight here, and we, we heard about this earlier, is thinking about acceptance of these products in a given setting. So it's important to think about what will be best suited for the health workers who will actually be administering vaccine, as well as for the community. And there are differences between the products available. We have heard a lot about dual introduction, and I agree it's exciting that this is moving forward across the board, it sounds. Um, so there are definitely benefits and, and challenges to be addressed in this. Just to repeat what you already know, 
There are opportunities for cost sharing across the three processes you would go through. So um, just for the dual introduction of PCV and Rhoda, as Veronica noted, you're eligible for two grants, which means there are places where costs can be shared between those um, that will allow for kind of maximizing the benefit of those grants. At the same time, there's the option for synergizing activities. So looking for tasks that would be completed in both introductions and pairing them. We see this frequently with things like launch events, trainings, um, updating materials. So just reducing the specific numbers uh, and burden of those tasks that need to be completed. All of that said, dual introductions are definitely more complex. So it's really important to ensure there is adequate planning and training, especially if those vaccine characteristics are quite different and to make sure that you build in flexibility for these plans. Um, as we've heard, some of the supply is in flux at times, and so having more agility to respond to that is key. I won't go too far into this because my colleague, Dr. Adikath, will speak on this a little bit later, but there's a lot of learnings that have been captured from countries that have done dual introductions. Three of those that we spotlight here um, are Ghana, Niger, and Tanzania. And so their experiences that have been documented in these dual introductions were, again, financial resources and activities could be streamlined, and that saved quite a bit as far as costs, and particularly was helpful in reducing the amount of time and health worker capacity that was needed for those specific activities. Training was a very key area for these streamlining tasks. That said, there's a lot of learnings that hopefully can inform your efforts as you build out applications and do implementation planning. Training is really important, particularly with the dual introduction, and that includes your cascade trainings as well as refreshers. We heard earlier today about the importance of refresher trainings for NITAG members, and the same applies for these dual introductions. There was a lot of feedback from these three countries about the importance of materials being very user-friendly and built again, with sort of a design thinking perspective, with the health worker needing to administer vaccines in mind. And that really helped build their confidence to effectively implement these vaccines. One piece of that that came through quite clearly was the use of tests or practice vials during trainings to make sure that health workers were comfortable with both of the vaccines and the distinctions between them for administration. These countries also reported a lot of supportive supervision and that being a really important piece post-introduction and similarly to do any additional refreshers for training. As we also just saw, timing is really important here as well. So these three countries tried to implement very early planning with very heavy and frequent stakeholder engagement, both to ensure everyone was on the same page about the implementation plans and to ensure there was continued buy-in for the importance of adhering to the new guidelines and places to identify pain points early on. Cold chain assessment, I'm sure is no surprise to see on here. And as we've talked about, the cold chain requirements for each of these vaccines is a little different. So it's important to do these assessments early and with the dual introduction in mind. So it may be a more complicated process um, and one that needs to be repeated as you get closer. And then lastly, as I mentioned, having community engagement and strong social mobilization is really crucial to these introductions, especially with two going at once. Um, and these three countries highlighted effective social mobilization as really crucial to the success of their programs. Um, and fortunately, you'll hear a lot more on this this afternoon. Okay, we've talked a little bit about schedule options. And as you just heard, the schedule for rotavirus vaccine is contingent on the vaccine product being used. But for PCV, you have two options that are in line with the WHO recommendations. So as you're navigating this decision, um, there's a lot of different guidance that can be used to inform it. We heard earlier about where the specific disease burden is, preferences for first year of life protection versus slightly longer duration. Um, and so it's important to weigh those when selecting one of these two schedules. Um, I will add too that looking at your existing coverage at the nine to 12 month dose when MCV1 is given can also help inform this decision. So if there's high coverage at that point, that may be another reason to consider. Um, and then lastly, as Veronica just described for us, the option for PCV catch-up is one that you will want to rationalize why you're not selecting it rather than why you are selecting it. So the default would be to pursue catch-up. Again, there are opportunities here. There's additional funding, as you just heard about, 
Um, so the cost should be quite reduced. And there may be opportunities to link this with other campaigns or other efforts, particularly as we're thinking about broader immunization program catch-up strategies right now. Um, this can also help accelerate the impact on disease burden because, of course, we would hope to see greater herd immunity um, and community protection. It does add some complexity, so important to integrate into training. Um, but again, across the three grants that you'd be eligible for, um, this is hopefully something that can be worked across all three initiatives. And then as Laura noted earlier, one thing to keep in mind is whether this would allow you to leverage those resources or if there's a risk of it diverting resources from other programs. Um, so just things to factor in early on in the planning process. All right, and I will close out with just a couple resources for your reference. Um, there is a lot of support to help inform these decisions and, and help you go through these sometimes lengthy procedures to make these decisions and apply for support. Um, so on this slide, there are a couple tools and frameworks that can be used to help ensure this is a very methodological process and you have all the data you require. One I will spotlight is WHO's capacity tool, um, which offers a five-step process for NITAGs and partners to consider specific decisions and ground them in country-selected criteria and data. There are also cost calculators available to help you estimate the program cost and the vaccine-specific costs for each of these. You are very aware of the position papers and evidence available. Um, we've talked today about interest in case studies and knowledge exchanges. There are a number of mechanisms for that, and we'll be happy to share some of those with attendees afterwards. But we are, as part of our scope, tasked with capturing some of these learnings. So it will be great as you go through these procedures to start the introductions. If we can also document those to share for other countries considering these. And then lastly, um, one plug for technical assistance, that this is available if needed. Um, there is TA through our team on choices to support the application, the implementation planning, uh, so we're happy to connect. And there are a number of other partners who can provide in-country um, or remote technical assistance. So I will wrap there. Thank you.